back a year ago. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Beer Bound Podcast. Today, we are joined by Dr. Jacob J. Shelley. Dr. Shelley has a doctorate in law from the University of Toronto. His doctoral thesis examines the use of private law in obesity prevention, specifically looking at the use of product liability law to require food manufacturers to warn consumers about the dangers inherent in their food products. Dr. Shelley holds a joint appointment with the Faculty of Law and the School of Health Studies and the Faculty of Health Sciences at Western University. Dr. Shelley is the Director of the Health Ethics Law and Policy Lab at Western. We're excited to speak to Dr. Shelley and learn more about his particular focus and how it relates to the Canadian government's new study, specifically from the Canadian Centre on Substance Use and Addiction. Its final reports points out that no amount of alcohol is safe and that consuming any more than two drinks a week is considered risky. So without further ado, we welcome Jacob Shelley to the Beer Bound Podcast. Jacob, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for inviting me to come on. Thanks for joining us. So Jacob, take us back a little bit further. What interests you in legal studies? Tell us your journey in the academic path that you have taken. Yeah, I kind of fell into law by accident. So uh, I got married pretty young and uh, my my wife and I at the time, we've since separated, but uh, at the time we uh, were looking for school and she went to um, Waterloo as I did at the time and she was studying health and she found a really great supervisor in Alberta. And so we moved to the University of Alberta and I didn't know what to do. At that time, I had just finished a master's degree in theology and I uh, and I decided that I should do a PhD, but I couldn't find a PhD program that I liked or a program that I could do without having to learn a new language. And I'm not very good at learning new languages. So I decided to just kind of click through all the programs. And as I was clicking, I saw the law school and thought, eh, that could be fun. So I wrote the LSAT. I applied to one law school. I got into that law school. Uh, during my first year of law school, I met someone named Tim Caulfield, who is uh, one of Canada's leading health law scholars, has done a ton of research on health and information and, and new technologies. He's made been wildly successful, has a Netflix series and great books. He, he wrote a book called, uh, is Gwyneth Paltrow wrong about everything? Looking at celebrity culture. So I got to see really cool research in, in health law. And so during my law degree, I, I worked for Tim and then I did a master's degree with Tim after that at the University of Alberta before coming back to the University of Toronto to do a doctorate. But law was just kind of an accident. It was just something that I could do that seemed appealing. And then when I started doing it, I realized just kind of how much I loved the field. I loved working with language. I like the idea of thinking about our responsibilities. But also, I, I really am a uh, someone who believes in, and thinks a lot about issues related to public health. I really love food. I love talking and thinking about food and thinking about our relationship with food and law offered a really cool window into how the food environment, how the food structures and systems are created. And so that's kind of what led me into my career now. Quite a bit of schooling under your belt. So you did a complete law degree, then a yeah. master's of laws, and then a, yeah. a PhD in Doctor law. law. Yeah. Doctor of Law. And then before that, I did a I did some other earlier degrees. So I went to school for a long, long time, right. um, which is not always the best idea. Like, you know, but uh, I, and then I got a job working in a school. So I've never really left school since I went in kindergarten. I've been in school since. And uh, it's kind of been where I've spent most of my time is in the learning environment. Right. And you said that in your particular, in your doctoral studies in law, you were particularly interested in food. Where does that <clears throat> come from? If, are you, do you have any culinary background or? I, you know, I, I don't know exactly why other than maybe I think what I'm really interested in is community. Uh, and I like, I like when we're together. It's actually, it fits really well with uh, this topic because having grown up religious, a number of years ago, I told someone who, uh, so I went to Bible college for a year too. So the, one of the people I knew at Bible college uh, way back in the day was a professor there, a great guy named Randy. And I once told his wife, Olive, that beer is my new church. <laughs> and she didn't really like that. But, but what I meant by that is that beer became about community. It's one thing I really love about going for a beer. It's the community. And, 
And I think food for me was really about community. And it was a way to kind of expose injustices. Like we all need to eat. Like we have no choice but to eat. And why should anyone eat garbage food? Why should we eat food that makes us sick? Why can we eat food that's poorly produced just so someone else can make a lot of money selling that food? Like why? And we've lost touch. And I'm, I'm a fisherman. I love fishing and uh, I love being in the outdoors. And so, you know, you get closer to food when you're a fisherman, like you have, or a, I don't hunt, but my brother does like you're, you're actually taking the life, you're cleaning that animal. And so you have a new appreciation for kind of where food fits in. And, and I really love this idea that, you know, if we can solve food, we can solve the world's problems. I think we can figure out how to make sure everyone's adequately fed and fed a, a healthy diet. So many people are sick because of what they eat or, or what they don't eat or, or when they eat or how they eat and, and where they eat. And, but we all still have to eat. And so, uh, you know, I think food presents this really cool window into uh, examining aspects of community and our responsibilities to one another. And then obviously that extends to things like coffee and, and beer and wine, like the, the, the community of, around partaking. And then that background in theology, there's a big kind of idea in my upbringing of food as being sustenance, you know, emotionally and spiritually as well. I don't believe this stuff anymore, but it's, you know, people have communion and it's supposed to represent the body of Christ and the partaking. So food is kind of integral in so many of our walks of life. And it was kind of a, a key theme. And then I grew up in a big family, one of seven kids. And so, you know, you had to, you had to eat when there was food on the table because we always had food on the table, but you know, with seven people there, if you didn't eat fast enough, you might not get a second crescent roll or more mashed potatoes. So food becomes a big part of how you think through your day. Um, and I just love, and food's delicious, but I have no real culinary skills. I try, but nothing, I wish. I watch a lot of Gordon Ramsay shows. And I do like Gordon Ramsay, so. I'm sure you picked up a few things to make your I picked up a little bit better. I picked up a few things, mostly how to, to get angry at employees, it seems. He seems to be angry a lot, but uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I do like uh, I do like how he, I think he's so passionate about doing it well. And that's what I think about, even with alcohol, and something I'm sure we'll talk about, like just doing it well, maybe means doing it less, but doing it well and eating well and drinking well and, and socializing well and, and thinking about what that means and how that can build community has been part of what uh, I really, I think why food attracts me so much as a topic. Yeah, I feel the same way. I, I'm a big fan of the late Anthony mm -hmm. Bourdain. He was kind of very symbolic to that, being exceptionally passionate about food and then kind of steering that passion of food towards culture and people and society and and turmoil that exists in geopolitics. Yeah, um, yeah I, think, uh, I think that's what Garrett and I really like about beer too. You can, beer Absolutely. is similar to food. You can really kind of tie it to so many different facets of life. Yeah history of politics yeah. culture so um you can't escape it it's ubiquitous right food is ubiquitous it's just part of everyone's existence and so it's that commonality and how we can connect over and through food but also how food can divide us right like it's no it's probably not a surprise that a lot of religions and a lot of kind of kind of deep systems of belief have entrenched dietary restrictions because it's, it's a separating it's like we're not going to eat like those people we're not going to be able to share and break bread together. And I think if we could break bread together, man, like we could solve a lot of problems. We could just sit at the table and, and share a meal and, and treat others as, you know, as an other rather than as a means to an end or something. But that's why food, foods for me is way more than just eating. Like it's, it's the entire, and you know, and my partner's a vegan. So like we, we have lots of interesting conversations about food. And, and I really believe like maybe about 15 years ago, one of the only other podcasts I've been on was at Western. It was called One Tasty Cow. Because I fit about 15, 20 years ago, I had this idea, like, I just want to eat one tasty cow. I want to take care of it. I want to raise it well. I want to love the cow. And then at the end of its life, I want to eat it. I want to appreciate it. And so I've thought a lot about food in different areas. And it, it is such a great way to kind of open up conversation about things. But, um, but yeah, it's absolutely, it's common from, for, for everyone. Everyone can connect on some level with food. And Jacob, you told us before we started rolling that you do have an interest in beer specifically. Can we touch mm -hmm. on that? Because Garrett and I also have said interest. Can yeah. you tell us about your interest in beer? Where does that come from? How extensive is that? So my interest in beer actually starts back when I was religious because I grew up in a teetotaling family. So I didn't drink alcohol until I was 23. Um, and quite deliberately, even as a young adult, didn't drink alcohol because it was associated in my family with a lot of terrible things. And, and, and rightly so, alcoholism, 
some domestic abuse and not my immediate family, but extended family and, and friends and, and you see the harms of it. And so my parents didn't drink at all. My parents still don't drink at all. But when I was in my early twenties, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm not really afraid of it. And I think it's about, you know, being responsible and consumption and thoughtful. So I actually set myself some pretty strict rules at the beginning. Like I always wanted to drink out of a glass. I don't follow that rule anymore. And I wasn't going to drink domestic. I wanted to drink quality. So I started buying like really good beer. I started drinking what would be, uh, and I was pretty naive about it because sometimes I would drink 10, 12% beers and not know that they were 10 or 12%. Like wow. uh, Unibrew has a, I, uh, the Quebec brewery has this great beer called Terrible. And I love it. And I haven't seen it in years, but it's one of the first beers I fell in love with. It was complex. It was interesting. You, you don't just sit back and slam a bunch of them. Like it was a 750 mil bottle. And I think it was 11 and a half percent, something like that. And so, um, but I started to fall in love with the variety of, um, of beers that are available, the different types of kind of flavoring or the, the approaches. And that, then I really fell in love with craft breweries and I fell in love with going places and going to the makers, going to places where people have passion and they really care about the products and they're, they're thinking about it. And, and I still enjoy that very much. Like one of the things I do when I travel is to, to check out cool breweries and I have, I have a couple places that I still all my like, all time favorite places I've been because I had like my first type of beer there that I, I really loved. Like I spent time in Victoria and I had like some of my favorite beers for years came out of a brewery called Phillips, which we can get here in Ontario in the LCBO, but they have some varieties out there that I've never seen here. Like the, the long, long boat chocolate Porter. It was like a mind blowing beer. It's just delicious. And, um, and I've always loved coffee. I've always loved like the art of the complexity of a drink that some people just take for granted. So I like the idea I've never done proper cupping, but I've actually had in my house, I used to do beer tastings, you know, pre COVID times I, more often. And I actually got laminated, you know, tasting charts where we'd write down our scores. And I would, I got to the point where I was doing blind tastings for my friends and then they would rank them. And it was fun. Like the best story is um, one of my buddies did not like, ranked the lowest in an IPA night, his favorite beer otherwise. Mm. When it was blind, it wasn't his favorite. Now, IPAs, it could have been a skunky version of what he was used to, right? You never know. Um, but I just love that, you know, that it's, it's more than what I was growing up and learning about it, that it was like drunkenness and alcoholism and all these negative things. Mm. I found like joy and, and then also community. I started going to, um, you know, to, to pubs with my friends or I started going to uh, to craft breweries where we just went for the purpose of going to those places to explore and, and hang out as friends. And, and, and my, my friend group, it's been, you know, I would say predominantly responsible behaviors. I can't account for everyone, but you know, we we're going in places where it can cost 10 bucks for a pint. So you're not going to slam beers. So like it's just too expensive. Um, and then, you know, like, uh, when I used to live in Kitchener, there's a, a bar there called Arabella Beer, uh, Arabella Park Beer uh, Bar, something like that. But Arabella is what I call it, anyways. It's on Belmont, and it's like one of the best bars I've ever been to in my life. There's no TVs; it's a wall of taps, constantly rotating. Great service. They know all the beers, and it's like you went there and you you ran into friends. And it's just like it was just a friendly, fun place to be. Uh, so it's been. Uh, it's something I really do enjoy and I have to actually be very careful about because I could probably drink beer every day and throughout the day because I just I really enjoy it. So it's something I actually have to think about. I think we fall into that same boat to some yeah. extent and yeah. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. But I love that. I love that story. I love I, we love hearing everybody's path, I guess, maybe path to craft beer, which is our forte. But I think a lot of the values that you hold close, Andy and I definitely hold close, right? It's the community. It's the, hmm. it's the learning a little bit more about it, drinking maybe in quality over quantity, definitely all the Absolutely. aspects of craft beer, even though, you know, there's probably been a time or two where Andy and I mentioned crushable beers, which maybe alludes to more quantity over quality, but um, like you say, can I count for everything? But uh, yeah, I love hearing everybody's story towards craft beer. That's great. And, and like, I'm happy to talk about crushables because I agree. There's a time and a place where it's just like, I just want to sit and drink a bunch of beer, right? Like, yeah. yeah. Hey, sometimes it's warranted, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Especially up. like a, you know, yeah. Anyways, Super Bowl times come coming back up. In. That's like a key. I think I could think of a time where you just sit in one spot and drink beer. It's the Super Bowl. You sit on the couch and you watch three hours of sports and you drink X amount of beers in that time. Now I've modified my behavior in that respect. So one of the things that I do is I drink a lot of non-alcoholic beer now. 
Uh, um, me and, too, actually. And it's because of this research, to be honest, and I can talk about that. But I, I did, I've done some research in alcohol policy over the last couple of years. And one day I was just like, I drink too much. I don't just drink beer. I also really love scotch. Um, and we are so I've gotten into, alike. Yeah, <laughs> well, Jacob, we well, need to hang out. Hang out. <laughs> yeah, we will, <laughs> for sure. But like, I, I decided like, I can't keep doing this, but I really love a cold beverage. I love carbonation. I grew up in a family, my dad didn't drink, but he drank Pepsi and like, and I don't want the sugars and the calories. So I started buying Sobeys fake beer and now I circle through Sobeys and President's Choice. And I, I tried three or four nights a week to, to only drink fake beer or at minimum to like put a couple fake beers in there because sometimes I don't need the alcohol. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I wish, and I hope the future of beer is that there's more and more low alcohol beer that's full flavor because a lot of the low you know light beers just aren't there for me i'm a i love stouts i love double ipas i like big beers that's hard to replicate so far in a non-alcoholic but i think we can get there but that's where you know on a crushable day i I now have moved to like lighter beer so if i'm going to have a couple because it's a hot day or i'm canoeing or i'm at a campsite I drink really light beer. I drink a lot of Slimin 2.0, like Slimin Clear, like stuff that's just like really light because I'm like less calories, less alcohol. And eventually I have to pee so much. I'm like, I'm done drinking because <laughs> I just don't want to have to go to the bathroom. So that's true. I, well, I get annoyed. alcoholic beers have come a very long way in, in, in yeah. a really short time. So it's really nice to see that. Uh, I think I, I, I'm definitely in the same boat as you there, Jacob. Like I've been trying to switch a little more to non-alcoholic beers just because, you know, if we would do want to come back to the guidelines, like I'd see myself having a beer every night for dinner and then maybe one yeah. while I'm doing work after <clears> dinner or something. And you know, next thing you know, I'm up to six beers a week without even hitting the weekend where I probably already have some. So I'm, yeah. I'm definitely moving towards that. It's tough to find good non-alcoholic beer, but it's getting better. Yeah. And there are some specialty stops, uh, shops. Like there's a place, I don't know if it's actually in outside of like Toronto and whatnot. Starsky, Starsky Fine Foods. They get a lot yeah. of imported stuff. And there's a whole, almost a whole aisle dedicated to non-alcoholic beer, German styles and Czech styles, I think. Oh, I got to go there. Of- that's, that's great information to know, right? Like yeah. if we could bring that in more... Because I think it's part of the, the, the you know, and this is obviously we're getting into these guidelines and part of it is not about prohibition. Like when, when I got interviewed by the CBC, I said like, I, like I would have gone for beer with the host that was interviewing me. Like I like going for beer. I take students for beer. I, but I wish I had the option and I also have friends that are alcoholics, right? So like, there's nice to have, have things that are, uh, you know, they're, or, or, you know, recovered uh, or, or that don't partake because they choose not to. And so I like having those options um, if they're, if they're interested in having a really good beverage still. And so, um, but I agree, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a an untapped market. It's probably a little bit harder and people don't want to spend money for a fake beer. They're like, why would I spend $4 on the fake? Like I buy the president's choice because I don't mind them, to be honest. Like, to be, to be, this is not meant to be a, a, a slag against cheap domestic beer, but I don't see a big difference between cheap fake beer and like Bud. Like it's to me, it's kind of the same. So if I'm going to drink crappy beer, I might as well drink crappy fake beer. It's kind of in my mind. Um, and then I'll spend the money to drink, like I'm drinking my local brewery tonight, Willibald's. And these aren't cheap, right? Like, but they're delicious and I'm supporting a local business. I can walk up the street and chat with the brewers. I can walk up the street and have a, a meal and we walk our dog there and I have a re- hope, you know, somewhat of a relationship with the establishment. So I'll spend my money there and then buy cheap beer. That's not as good. That's fake, you know, and drink that all the time. But, uh, but it was, it was because of stuff like this, this research that made me go like, I, I just, it's so easy to drink three beers. Like it's just, it's not even difficult to drink three beers. Like three beers is kind of like, that could be an easy night every night. And then when you think about it, that's, even if you only drank five nights a week, that's, that's the 15, that's the old guidelines, right? Like that's 15 yeah. drinks a week already. And it depends on how heavy your beer is. Cause not everyone thinks about that, right? Like this beer is a uh, six and a half. So this is more than a standard drink. For sure. So. And craft typically will veer a little bit on the higher end of that. That, yeah, you know, absolutely. I'd say on average, you know, we could typically have bigger, yeah. bigger styles like IPAs and whatnot. Yeah. So maybe to that point, Jacob. So you say you know you're trying to lean a little bit more to the non-alcoholic aspect, simply because changing habits and you know, I think we've already agree we're probably in the same habits. It yeah. can obviously take time or be very tough. The new guidelines, which are you know it says two beers a week, which is you know probably significantly less than what people are already drinking, and it's also significantly less than what the previous guideline was. Do you see people? 
um, you know, even if it's close people or, or just trends in general, where maybe apart from non-alcoholic beer, where people might try and fill that void a little bit, what, you know, would it be some drinking something entirely different? Would it just be like pacing? What do you think? What do you, what's your thought on that? Like instead of drinking alcohol, what they might turn to? Yeah. Or any coping, yeah. Mechanism, I guess. Yeah. Like there's a lot of things. Like I think one of the things that we don't talk about in these conversations is what drives people to consume as well, right? I think it's part of what we should be chatting about. And like the the guidance is, I've been telling some folks lately when they ask me about like only two drinks a week, like and I'm like, no, 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 that's just, that's with no risk. Like you just have to accept that there's risk. It's interesting because that risk, that responsibility already is something we can talk about. It already exists for manufacturers to warn consumers about. It's not, it's not to say that like, I'm not a prohibitionist. And in fact, I I would never endorse prohibition uh, just because I really like beer. <laughs> like I don't, I don't want to get rid of beer. It's about knowing the risk levels, and that might modify one's behavior. And, and even if you don't go down to less than two a week, if you go from twenty to ten, that's going to have significant impacts and benefits for you, even though you're still at higher risk than someone who doesn't drink at all. But like I think a lot of people when they when they are using alcohol for some it's a social lubricant they talk about like they need to you know, loosen up and, and i i can appreciate that but also that's been kind of a normalized idea that you can't meet without having a drink like it's kind of weird you know i i don't have a lot of guy friends that i say hey do you want to go for a tea with right like maybe coffee but that's also feels more like work like coffee mm. feels like a date you know beer feels like i'm getting together with my buddies but that's partly because we've just kind of inculcated society with that like I, I play in a men's hockey league here in my town and some of the guys joke we play hockey to drink beer right and heard that <laughs> right so it's, it's a bit of both right but like it there is sometimes this idea that if you don't go out for beers after you're not a part of the team and we have to move away from that to open up the doors but I think there are there's lots of things that people can do to kind of address like how they consume and thinking through how they consume I've mentioned this a few times but I I I did some work for a group called the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer a couple of years ago. I helped them put together what's called a, a policy pack on alcohol. And we looked at the federal, provincial, and 31 different municipal jurisdictions, their policies on alcohol. And to do that research, we had to do some background stuff. And that's what I really was kind of like, my team and I, we were, it was often, it was a side project for me. So it was often at night. And my team and I, when we would chat, like, I was often like, I'm having a beer while I'm doing this, like all the time. And I, it, it kind of dawned on me, like I've just kind of made it a norm that I'm just going to at night crack a beer. And so that's part of where the, the non-alcoholic and the changing the, the the kind of the approach that you take and, and, and where you insert it or just thinking about it more even is already when you start paying attention to how often you crack a can or open a bottle or like you start actually paying attention to the amount you're consuming and thinking that through it might, uh, I'm not sure this is quite answering the question, but, but it starts to like uh, inform our are thinking about about how we're consuming and i think we've been we've been trained to not think about consumption like there's a couple of places I, I don't drink i don't drink at concerts very often i don't drink at i don't go to a lot of sports games but i don't drink at sports games like a, i wouldn't drink at a jays game or a leafs game because they're getting me to pay 12 dollars for a crappy beer yeah, that's a like lot. why would i don't need this i'll just go get a good beer later like why would i spend all this money like i was at a mumford and Con uh, son's concert and I think my partner and I shared one drink because it was like fifteen dollars for like some. It was like one of those real tall cans. Yeah, Still, it's like cans, yeah. It's like it's so big that by the end it's warm, and I don't even want to drink it. So it's like, why am I doing this? Why am I wasting my money? But it's so inculcated that we just drink at these events rather than going, hey, like let's change the, you know, let's go for a really good beer. Let's go drink. Maybe we only have two beers because they're ten dollars each because they're they're really delicious imports from Belgium or they're a really well-made craft brew at, you know, Blood Brothers or something where you can go and get like something where there's a craft to it, right? Like they love what they do. And that's the kind of beer I like. I like beer that has a story to it. It's not just about, hey, buy and drink more. It's like the the, the sharing and the loving of the of the craft. I'm not sure that answers your question. I kind of got in a rant. No, that's good. No, it's a great perspective on it. Like it's not necessarily always how to cope out it, but a, 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 I like your answer. A better way to think about how you consume is probably the better way to go as opposed to, satisfying a current habit or a current urges right maybe you change your lens on consumption what you drink how you, and when you drink i like also that. try not to be judgmental because you know there is an addictive element to this this product for a lot of people and there are people that struggle with alcoholism and i you know i work in alcohol policy and i want people to know about the risks but i'll never shame people i i don't tend to hang out in places where the the the, the aim is you know massive you know, amounts of consumption or intoxication like i go to i go to craft breweries i i buy 
I buy good beer, I, you know, what I consider good beer. But I think that I also don't want to judge people that there are a lot of people for whom alcohol might be an escape from an otherwise very difficult life. So we need to also talk about what we can do to help people cope in what is increasingly a difficult world to live in, right? Like there's a lot of challenges uh, for a lot of people. And so alcohol takes the edge off. And I think if we were to deny that, that would be mis that'd be a mistake. But we shouldn't also pretend that it's benign. We have to accept that there's a risk to this right. behavior. And, it, and it's not an insignificant risk. And I think that's, you know, really what's important about these new guidelines is that one of the questions that I got asked in one of the media appearances I did was, you know, is this like crazy that Canada is like so far out there? Like they're like, no one else is doing this. And I said, is it bad to be in the front of a race? Like, you know, maybe that we're the cutting edge of this, but the evidence here is not meant to like, maybe some will use it to promote prohibition or abstinence, but it's really about being informed and having information to make an informed choice. And I think, I think it actually bodes well for the industries that I really like, like my local brewery, because if people bought better quality and less quantity, it supports people like them. And I would love to see that kind of beer culture exist rather than Molson and Budweiser that own, you know, and, and Einheiser Bush and these big conglomerates that kind of ruin beer a bit, to be honest, in my opinion. And I might be, I don't, I told you it might be controversial. I don't know if you want to get the, no, the big okay. guy that's coming good. after you or not, but everyone's not, opinion is a good one here. Yeah. <laughs> well, Jacob, we've obviously danced around the subject of what the Canadian Center of Substance Use and Addiction has come out. This really has kind of gone viral all, all across the country in Canada. Um, I've seen memes about it. I've seen different videos about it. There's this gentleman who was, <laughs> he had a video, I think it might have been like CTV or CBC interviewed him and that went viral, this guy talking about yeah, I saw the him. large quantities of alcohol he, yeah. he consumes and how absurd it is to even think about having two drinks a week. Because that is, I think, I think for individuals in Canada who do choose to drink, there are quite a lot of people who abstain and drink none. But if you yeah. enter the realm of drinking at all, which is a fair amount of, which is a substantial percentage of the population. If you enter that realm of drinking at all, two beers per, two drinks per week does seem a little bit low. I do want to get to, into this a little bit further. Yeah. And, and um, you, as we mentioned, you had uh, great takes. I read some of your interviews with both the CBC and the BBC. And I do want to get into that quickly, but I wanted to see if you can give us a little bit of a crash course on how maybe touching base on some of your previous expertise towards food manufacturers and food companies in Canada, how does that work in terms of what they put into their products, into their food products, and what liabilities and responsibilities these food companies have when it comes to them labeling what they've put into their, into their product? Because I can think of, yeah. for example, we can all think of unhealthy food that is completely legal, like fast food establishments. And now in Ontario, for example, the province, you have to put the amount of calories that goes into whatever food you're consuming, which is good. It's a good piece of information for consumers to have when they're deciding what they want to eat for lunch or dinner, for example. But what other liabilities exist in and what limitations do you have? Say I want to create a restaurant and I want to put in maybe a certain amount of sugar into my products that might be unhealthy. Mm -hmm. Like what liabilities or potential, yeah, liabilities or responsibilities goes into this, like in terms of having legal consequences or actions taken against them in terms of what they put into their product, as well as the labeling process of this. Yeah. So it's, it's a big question with a lot of different avenues, but I think what I could, what I would start with is that it's, it's long been part of the legal system that those that sell products have responsibility to the people they sell those products to. So the law really evolved historically. And part of this actually was food. So there's there's some case law from the 1500s, for example, um, already establishing the responsibility of tavern houses for when they sold spoiled meat, for example, to uh, someone that was staying there and got sick. So this has long been something we've contemplated. And so it's not new to consider the role and the liability of manufacturers. And indeed, our, our current system that, the, the requirement to provide warnings evolved from, you know, is largely traced back to a case called Donahue and Stevenson is this, this idea of negligence that when we put out a uh, harm into the society that is deemed to be negligence that you have to compensate those injured by it. And it's a complicated, more complicated story than that, but suffice it to say the kind of the origins of that story were in part 
out of a ginger beer, like non-alcoholic, but it was out of a product that there was a snail that was decomposing in the bottle when the consumer poured it out. It poured this decomposed snail eventually on her ice cream and she felt sick and, and she sued the manufacturer saying, you have a duty to think about me when you sell that product, that your product doesn't harm me. And really the, the, the law of negligence evolved from this idea of the neighbor principle. So it ties back to that idea of community I love as well, that we're responsible for how our actions affect our neighbors. Uh, and there are limitations to the way the law has circumscribed that duty. So without being too technical or too jargony, you know, it has to be for foreseeable risks, risks that you can foresee might harm someone, you may have a responsibility to prevent i.e. we shouldn't harm other people. So that's where really some of the, the responsibilities really emerge from. But as the state kind of evolved historically, and we started having governments and more and more constitutional approaches um, that were, you know, we also have legislation that starts to uh, emerge as governments try to regulate product environments. And, and they've long regulated food. Um, they started regulating food uh, largely for concerns about purity and contamination. But it's more than that, um, and, and it's gotten very, very complicated. The, the food environment is a very complicated space with a lot of different kinds of rules. And so the labeling question, for example, um, with, with labeling, it, it depends on a couple of things, right? There are requirements that technically manufacturers have to meet whether or not there's legislation, but they also have to comply with what the legislation or regulations may say. They may also belong to certification groups. So they may belong to, like if you belong to an organic certification, you have to meet certain criteria to use that label. Or if you have a, you know, potentially a, some sort of proprietary claim, or there's all sorts of different ways that what you can say might be either controlled by legislation, regulation, agreements, contracts, or what we would consider private law responsibilities. And so it really depends on what we're talking about and how it might be regulated. But we started regulating products more and more as we found that they were risky to consumers. In theory, a manufacturer has a responsibility to, to compensate a consumer for the harms that, that follow from the use of their product that are foreseeable or that are reasonably foreseeable misuses. And that, that's why we have in our shoe packages, don't eat this salt, right? That's why we have warnings on don't use your hair dryer in the shower and so on. We, we're very used to these kinds of warnings, but we've accepted that when it comes to things that we eat and consume, that they're not that important. And so for some reason, when it comes to some of the things that actually have the most potential to harm us, I think, again, because they're ubiquitous and we've kind of just been lulled into like, you know, apples are safe, you know, or food is safe, that we don't really think about ingredients. And most people don't think about ingredients. It's another reason why... I like beers. I learned how to make beer with my neighbors. I, I have friends that are craft brewers. I've sat and stirred and, and like added hops. I've seen the process. I understand what's in it. So I know what kinds of beers I want to drink as a result. But a lot of food products now, people have no idea what's in their food products. And, and so the regulations might control that. There are many, uh, the Food and Drug Act in Canada and the Food and Drug Regulation, which is a federal statute. It's a very complicated, very long, very detailed, specific about what kind of claims you can make, how you have to label various things. But we also have consumers driving some, you know, uh, changes because people want to know about particular concerns. So we can see evolution in some markets, you know, like the, you know, providing more information about sourcing maybe than maybe would normally be provided about coffee beans or something, how they're ethically obtained. It might be more information than is required. When it comes to liability, it's a bit of a tricky issue because in order to prove liability or to find liability in, in court, you have to demonstrate on a balance of probabilities. It's more likely than not that the injury was caused by that product. And the history of this has been marred by the tobacco industry. So when people started trying to sue the tobacco industry for uh, the harms from cigarettes, the tobacco industry took some tactics that have been adopted by most industries now, where it's like, you can't prove it was us. Like, yeah, so what? You got cancer from smoking. Prove it was our cigarettes. And unfortunately, um, you know, this is my bias, you know, but I'm, a, I'm trained heavily in law and I'm a law professor. The legal profession uh, caters to those that pay their bills. And it, big corporations have a lot, a lot of money. So the law has really evolved to protect, I think, corporations from liability because consumers can't make a case that they can prove for sure that in the case of alcohol, that your alcohol caused me to get cancer. That's going to be a hard claim to maybe make, but that's where warning labels actually become really important because one of the things that emerges in the private law is that 
under product liability law, which is a subset of that broader area known as negligence law, manufacturers have a duty to protect consumers from defective designs in their products, the defective manufacturing of products, but also the defective warnings in products. Products are supposed to come with sufficient information to warn consumers about the inherent risks. And that's part of why one of the biggest messages that I think needs to come out of these reports is that we're not being told the truth by industries that are selling us products. And the report isn't telling anyone to stop drinking, you know, or isn't forcing anyone to stop drinking. Like the gentleman in that viral video, it was funny because he actually t- talked about pop at the end of that video, right? Like no one's telling me to not take pop home. And I'm like, actually, many of us are. Like there was actually warning labels uh, imposed on soda, uh, sugar sweetened beverages in the US at one point, but they got fought by industry and the court sided with industry. But we should have warnings on soda. We should be telling people there's nothing nutritious about this. It's just sugar. It leads, it's linked highly with diabetes, obesity, hypertension, cavities. Like we should, and, and people might know that. Um, and that may be more well known than the risks of alcohol. But I think a lot of people are unaware of the risks of alcohol. But even more alarming, they're not aware of when risk occurs. Like at what level of consumption am I becoming at risk? And the reality is, is I've accepted risk in drinking alcohol. I've made that informed choice for myself, but I've also modified my behavior. And the idea of liability is if manufacturers are not giving us the information that we need to make informed choices, then they provided a defective product because it didn't have sufficient information. Whether there will actually be liability in a court is something that's yet probably too early to know it. The courts really aren't favorable to these types of arguments, but not for principled reasons in my mind. But that's where legal scholarship might divide. People don't necessarily adhere to my view, but I think that manufacturers ought to be warning us. I think, you know, we should be being given warnings about food products. Most people aren't aware that there are some products at fast food restaurants that account for your entire daily caloric intake. Or people aren't aware that Subway's bread isn't bread. It's actually classified in many jurisdictions as cake because it has so much sugar in it. They've, been, they've had to face litigation, I think it was in Ireland, because they were, they, they were for tax evasion because they weren't being taxed properly because it's a confectionery once it's a cake, no longer a staple as a bread, right? Most people don't think about that stuff. They just go, it's, ah, it's a sub, it's healthy, it's got vegetables, it's bread. Not realizing that, you know, or the, the, the healthy muffins you can get at Tim Hortons or something that are actually like 600 calories. Like, like people just aren't aware of what's happening. And that's part of the, the, the easiest way to rectify that rather than prohibitions or, or restrictions is to say, provide the information and let consumers at least make informed choices. That's a good point. And I guess that sort of <clears throat> falls into your area of research and expertise and whatnot. You know, it sounds like you work with labels and how, how these things should be shown, whether it's on a, on a bottle or a package. Because right now, you know, I don't, I don't think I've ever really seen a, a label on a, on a beer can. Uh, maybe on some imported German lagers, I see, you know, the pregnant lady with the cross to it, like, no, yeah. no pregnancy, you know, don't drink when you're pregnant, that sort of thing. But now that we have these guidelines, do you think that that would push, that might be a good push for labels on, on beer or let's say alcohol in general? And, and if, if you think that's the case, you know, how do you think we go about that? Yeah. So there's been some actually, Canada has led the way in some of this research. There was a great study out of the Yukon. So maybe in the same articles you saw me and Aaron Hoban, who's at Public Health Ontario and who have known for many years. So it's kind of fun that I've known her. Uh, and so we've been able to chat about this research a bit. It's been fun to be kind of showcased alongside her because she did this really cool study where they put cancer warnings on alcohol in the Yukon. And they showed that it had an impact on consumers' behavior. It didn't make people stop buying alcohol, but it made some people buy less or maybe think twice. And so what it looks like, I think, is still yet to be determined. I think there are a couple different ways this could happen. I would love to find a couple of breweries that are willing to like be vanguards and like put labels on like, hey, and I don't know what they look like because it's not just cancer and it's not just cirrhosis of the liver, like an epilepsy, it's injuries. Like there are a lot of things that alcohol is risk, the risks involved with. So it might just be that alcohol is risky. Like maybe brewers that can get ahead of the game or, or, or wineries to say, look, like, consume responsibly. And and they've done this already, right? They do this with drunk driving. They realize we have to get ahead of the narrative with with irresponsible driving. So most most breweries, most uh, locations have discussions about drink responsibly. So it's like, okay, well, what does that mean then? Like, you know, drunk driving is obviously a very big deal. And we need to, you know, ensure that's not happening in society. 
But the impact of drunk driving is minuscule in terms of the actual number of people affected compared to the overall harms of alcohol. It's one of the leading causes of hospitalizations. It's a cause of like, I think it's like five to, I don't remember all the stats, five to 8% of cancers in Canada. Like that's a significant amount of a burden. So, you know, it's, I think it is the future, it, but it also should be the present. The obligation exists. The reason why they don't provide the warnings is because you'd have to sue them and you'd have to win. You'd have to have the money to take that lawsuit forward. And unfortunately, you know, I wouldn't be, you know, the the, the consumption of, of these types of products supports a lot of industries. I wouldn't be surprised if you were the person doing this to get a lot of pushback. Like it's the hospitality industry, the sports industry. It's so many things are wrapped up in alcohol, but also if that's the case, all the more reason why we ought to be demanding, like, look, if this is everywhere and it's this risky, we, we really should know. And, and, and again, it's not about not having any risk. I play ice hockey as a, in my forties and I didn't play growing up. So I'm not very good. Like I risk injury every week I play hockey. Like I really do. I'm not good enough to play hockey. So, but I'm willing to take that risk. And I, I risk injury doing lots of things. I whitewater a canoe. I, I take, but I take calculated risk. I wear all my gear on the, on the rink. I play with the right crew. When I'm whitewater, I wear my PFD. I wear my, my helmet. I have safety gear. I've read safety books. Like I'm I'm really well prepared, but then we go out and get a beverage and we don't even think about most of the risks that attenuate from that consumption. So I think that there is, it is about like that label may not make a lot of difference for some people, but it might make a difference for others. And I think it will particularly make a difference for those that don't drink yet, because they're going to grow up in an environment much the same that we have this shift in, in tobacco products and, and, and packaging and, and marketing and access and restrictions all are important part of controlling products that are dangerous. And so the next generation might look at these beverages and go, there's cancer warnings in this. Why do like, I don't need, like I didn't drink till I was 23 and I had a great teenage life. I had a lot of fun. I hung out with my friends. I did all the fun stuff I wanted to. I didn't need to drink. I look back and go, ah, I like beer. Like I'm not afraid of drinking, but I didn't need to. So I can do both. So why not drink responsibly and drink, you know, just drink less and drink better quality. And then I'm not drinking garbage. I'm drinking like, this is a delicious beer. I wish I had another one, you know, like yeah. it's, it's worth drinking good quality beer. So yeah, I agree for sure. Uh, knowing about it, what is half the battle. And to your point, I was going to say, uh, even if we do do that and we have these labels, we're going to see pushback from everybody. Alcohol is a huge industry. Yeah. And anything that's going to diminish the bottom line on, on that front is definitely going to see some resistance. So, I'm, I'm But we've normalized allowing industries that make a lot of money that may be convenient. Like driving home tonight, I saw a new gas station being built across the road from another gas station. I was like, do we really need more gas stations? Like, like we're normalizing a behavior that's actually harmful at the end of the day for us as a species. It's making some people very, very, very rich. Like I would love to brew my own beer more. I would love to be a more of my own producer as well. And because part of it's like, uh, for me, it's not just that I enjoy drinking or don't enjoy drinking. I'm annoyed that people are like making a ton of money off of something that makes other people ill and causes a lot of harm. And they don't bear the cost of that. Like mm -hmm. alcohol industry is not paying for the hospitalizations that occur from alcohol. And and because of how our tax systems work, they may not even be contributing as much as they ought to in other ways, like through taxes. And so it is this interesting kind of space to, to have to think about that, you know, we, why have we just normalized these industries that cause harm and just kind of go, eh, and part of it's because we enjoy it and it's fun, but part of it's also, they spend a lot of money telling us that every time we go to a cottage, we need to drink. And every time we go to a hockey game, we need to drink. And every time we celebrate something, we need to drink. And every time we go to a wedding or a funeral or a birth or a birthday party, like we need to drink. And and part of what I think the this kind of guidance will do is to tell people like, look, like that's not without risk, but also maybe there's an alternative way. And that's where we you know, go full circle back to the, the non-alcoholic stuff. Like there's a real, there's a real market there for a producer. Like, you know, I, I've had some, some really great, like uh, Red Racer has a great uh, non-alcoholic beer that I had when I was out West. Um, I'm going to go to Starsky's now, like for sure. Like I'm going to go stock up yeah, because- <laughs> like it is, it is totally the, the, like, and then I just now, even if I've only cut my alcohol consumption in half, like that's a net good because it's not just that it's two drinks and then it's risk. It's, it's, it's escalating risk. Right. And it depends on your age and your gender and it depends on what the risk is for. But if people drink less as a result of this guidance, because it makes them go, 
Wow. And I think a lot of people will. I think people will go, what? I'm only supposed to drink twice a week? Or even even if it's just that people think about what am I actually drinking? Like, what is a standard drink? Most people, I test my students all the time. Most people have no idea what a standard drink is or how to gauge a standard drink. Right. And yeah. so, you know, like if you're not measuring, I measure when I make cocktails. Like I pay attention to the ABV on alcohol when I'm drinking. Mm-hmm. And if you don't, like you are putting yourself at greater risk. And that's just, to me, it's kind of like, it's like playing hockey without a jock. Like I've never been hit yet with a puck, but I don't want to play hockey without a jock. <laughs> Right, like yeah, no one's rolling the dice no. on that. <laughs> yeah, like this is not worth the risk, right? But did it, did these alcohol guidelines make you guys like? So this is the thing you hear people say, "Wow, well, well, whatever, this is this is stupid. I'm never going to do that." But I think a lot of people are more reasonable and go, "Okay, well, let me take stock." So wh- how did you guys react to the to the, the report? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I don't know, not without any shock and awe. I think you know. Andy and I are entrenched in the in the beer industry, and we know that you know beer is it's high in calories. Uh, it's full yeah. of alcohol, as we've discussed already. Higher ABVs, especially with craft beer, which is you know our main go tos, um, and we're doing that repetitively. Like you, I don't know. I don't want to say it's just common sense, but like if you stop, like you said, stop to think about it a second, and then you see, okay, if you look at it from a from a higher view, from you know, you do that every day every other day or on the weekends and like, okay, you don't make a big deal of it. But all of a sudden you find out you've been doing that two, three times a week, four times a month, you know, throughout the entire year, obviously it's going to, it's going to have an impact on you. Uh, myself, I, like I said earlier on, we talked before we got on, like I'm trying to like you trying to switch to non-alcoholic beer, uh, just get the carbonation of a non-alcoholic beer, then still that malt flavor and, you know, wean myself off a little bit. Uh, sometimes I make a cheeky uh, rationalization. I'll just have a little bit of scotch because it's less calories. Not probably yeah, not. I did that for a long time. No. <laughs> probably <laughs> and I just started drinking way too much scotch. <laughs> so I had to, I had to like, it started off, I'm just gonna have a little bit of scotch because less calories. And suddenly it's like, uh, I'm drinking way too much scotch. Yeah. Then yeah, you gotta, you tip sometimes or maybe you tip yeah. a little too far yeah. the other way. But yeah, I, yeah, I'm, I don't know if it was the guidelines that really made me pull back for, for other reasons, maybe just in general health, but um yeah i wouldn't say it's taken me by surprise but i i understand it i get it yeah i i think as well we interviewed about maybe three weeks or a month ago a gentleman named william porter who wrote a book right. called alcohol explained it's kind of a it's a text that really is geared towards readers who are interested in sobriety and he's he's been sober i think for 10 years he used to be quite an alcohol consumer and decided that cold turkey was the way to go and he wrote about it and after reading that and kind of in the last month or so kind of studying a little bit more and and having this um, report coming out from the Canadian Center of Substance Use and Addiction, I mean, it does make you think. And I totally agree with you, Jacob, that having more information on the label, I really do support that. I, I'm not, I, and I totally agree with you as well. I'm not in favor of prohibition. We tried that about a hundred years ago. That doesn't work. Never it's, gonna work. Yeah, definitely. But having all the information at your fingertips of like, okay, you can indulge in this, but there is risk. You can do this, but there is risk. I mean, I think that does make sense. I, I did want to jump a little bit, and I know this maybe goes above your expertise in the legal realm. But do you have any context or or idea of what what provisions or information that is utilized by say the ccsa to make these decisions they've come up with this number of two drinks per week is anything above that is risky do you have any any concept of what provisions what measurements they're they're looking to in in order to make this final decision this is where i've seen some criticisms of the report on some of these grounds and i think one of the things maybe before jumping into the to a response is to to contextualize research in general a there's a lot of research out there and some of the research is better than others right And, and we've seen in society that you know uh, we have we've done a very poor job of communicating risk and understanding risk, and the pandemic has revealed that tremendously. And as someone that works in public health who has followed the the, the evidence and experts on COVID, like we've just kind of said we don't care about science as much anymore. We look for evidence that confirms what we want to believe, and that's easy to do in every field. And so I think 
in, in, I wasn't involved in this report. I don't work with the CCUSA uh, uh, directly. I have worked with uh, or, um, CCSUA. I have worked at other alcohol policy teams in the past, but I'm the legal expert. So I don't do a lot of like the evidence evaluations because it's not my expertise. But there are, one of the things about these types of reports is that there are pretty transparent pathways that you can follow how they got to where they got. So they, they did evaluate, uh, you know, meta-analyses and whatnot. And, and they, I think they narrowed down from about 6,000 articles. But in evidence, it's always a question of, is it measuring the right thing? Is it, is it reliable? You know, what kinds of variables did it take into account? And, and this is obviously a complicated problem because cancer is not just caused by alcohol. And you know, one of the stories I share about this, it's not my story to share, but, but my partner's father died from esophageal cancer, which is a, a known risk for alcohol, but also he was a firefighter and it's a known risk for his occupation, right? And so which of these two things was the, what we would attribute the cause to? And that's how the industry sometimes shields themselves from liability. We, we eat foods that are dangerous. We partake in activities that are dangerous, you know, Carcinogenic uh, things exist in, you know, yoga mats. Uh, you know, there's pollution that can cause cancer. So it's hard sometimes to know with certainty. So there has to, you know, and I, so it has to be some assessment of the quality of the science and what it's measuring and how well it's doing that. And I don't, I'm not involved in that stuff, so I don't have an inside look into, um, to all those inner discussions. But I, what I can say is, in the work that I do, I work closely with the people that do that work. So someone like Aaron Hoban, who's you know, carefully kind of studied this, like I chat with her and I, you know, she's, she, I've been fortunate that she's guest lectured for me. And I once was coming home from an event and we were on the same plane was well, an alcohol policy event. So it kind of made sense. We were both there, but we're sitting beside each other on the plane and, and got a chance to chat and, you know, folks like her spend their life learning how to do this type of research. And, and I think that there sometimes is this perception that there's this bias against industry but the reality is, is like, no one's making money and telling you not to drink less, but someone's making a lot of money telling you to drink more, right? And so, um, but at the end of the day, some of the, the research here is going to be based on the quality and who they study, the populations and the risk percentages. There's modeling sometimes involved. So, um, you know, the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer has some really great modeling that's using data from all sorts of different inputs. It's beyond me to explain how they get there, but I've sat in the room where they've I've learned about it. I just don't retain it very well. Um, and so part of what I end up doing in my work is, is relying on people that I know to be trustworthy and that I've seen consistently be trustworthy in their reporting and in their analysis. And so in, in this case, like these kinds of guidances can be controversial, particularly when they're a departure from what existed prior. But in the previous you know, iterations of some of this, we've had industry influence, but also our evidence gets better and better as we pay more attention to the particular risk factors. We start being able to develop studies that can kind of differentiate, you know, remove variable. So remove the variable of smoking or remove the variable of, of occupation or, or, you know, other kind of risk factors to kind of like create a more cohesive story. But I'd be, I'd be, I'd be misleading you to, to suggest that my expertise could explain exactly how they get there. Cause I don't do that, that work. I, my work is more taking what, these individuals, you know, come up with. And like my, you know, my marriage didn't work, but my ex-wife is a research scientist, right? Like I spent 15 years married to a person who I watched do research and learned, you know, like this is not, you know, a, a whimsical kind of response. And I think they, there's a lot of deep commitment to paradigms and, 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 you know, statistical analyses and things that truly are beyond me. I don't pay a lot of attention to, um, but but they're but but they're able to be vetted, right? You can go and actually it's transparent. And I think that's part of what right. you know. So there are people that say the report isn't taking into account the rest, the best evidence. And that's always going to be critiques. They have to make decisions as to what counts and what doesn't count. And that's maybe where the human kind of biases could come in. And there's risks of that. But they're also being transparent in how they're identifying that. And it's very common in 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 scientific research to have to do that. I'm not sure well, that answers your question entirely, but it very much does. But <laughs> Jacob, but back to your expertise in the legal realm, yeah. do you see this as a bit of a a Pandora's box, I guess, for future potential lawsuits? So now the Canadian government has basically said, okay, well, 
alcohol before in 2022. Now we view it as a much more potentially dangerous substance for anyone to consume. So can someone take the study and the report that comes from the Canadian Center on the Substance Use and Addiction, can they take that information and potentially create a legal justification for legal action in the future yeah. if they were to say, for example, uh, um, be diagnosed with liver cancer um, in their later years of age. Is that a potential absolutely. that you can see down the road? Are we going to see more of these potential lawsuits? It absolutely will be used as evidence and it's important evidence um, for this kind of thing. And, and in, in product liability law, government standards are often deemed to be the minimum requirement for manufacturers. So you can always exceed what the government wants. So right now there isn't a government standard for reporting or for disclosure of risks. But I think that what's interesting is that this report at a minimum kind of reinforces what we already knew that, which is that alcohol is risky and the manufacturers ought to, ought to warn consumers of that risk. And, and the industry really has, you know, they have a really easy out here actually, to some extent. Now it's more complicated because the, the, the case law would say for a warning to be adequate, it has to meet certain criteria. There are certain things that have to happen which I can speak to, but, but, but more importantly, the industry could take a dangerous product and put a warning label on it. And it takes that product out of the category of dangerous into a product that the consumer is warned about. And a warning renders what would otherwise be defective to be a safe product. Now it's not safe because it still has risks, but you are aware of the risk. And there are many, many products where, again, we've normalized that kind of warning. And and so the industry could just say, okay, well, we don't want to be sued. So we're going to start warning consumers of the risk. What makes it way more complicated is that we also know that the industry has been putting a lot of pressure on the government. Like we don't have a national alcohol act. We really need federal legislation to regulate alcohol, to make it consistent for a variety of reasons. Um, but we have that with tobacco. We have that with cannabis. Why don't we have that with alcohol? Like, we did it with cannabis and cannabis causes way less harm than alcohol overall. So like we, we, we probably should have some more legislation for guidance in this respect, but, and that would maybe force the alcohol industry to have labels. But if the alcohol industry preemptively started saying, Hey, look, like we want you to know there's risk with this, that would actually maybe shield them from liability here. Realistically, I think that, again, this is a cynical perspective, but the way that the law, like I've just spent too much time in this space, like there's no question in my mind. I've, I've spent seven years researching the responsibility of food manufacturers to warn consumers about risks and products. There's just no question they have that obligation. Whether they actually are forced to do that or are going to ever be held accountable is very different. It took decades of litigation against tobacco to get tobacco to be, you know, really reined in. Mm -hmm. And we knew about the risks of tobacco all along and the tobacco industry fought that and the tobacco industry undermined the research and undermined scientific integrity, in fact, uh, of many institutions and called and created entire categories of research to undermine legitimate re research. So it, it is a complicated story. So I doubt that it will actually result in liability, but can it? Yes. Should it? Yes. Like alcohol industry knows about the risk and we have like some of the case law that I've studied, um, there's a famous case called Hollis and Dow Corning, and it's a case about breast implants. And, and the argument was that the breast implant manufacturer didn't warn the consumers of the risk of the rupture. And we see this more and more now of the rupturing of breast implants and the dangers that come along with that. And, and they weren't warning of that risk. And the court said that when you ingest something into your body, the, the, the duty for manufacturers is heightened because it, it's an existential threat. That could kill you, right? And so, so here, there's no question that they have an obligation to warn. There's lots of obligations that we have in society that unless someone holds you accountable for, aren't met. And that's kind of what's happening here. The likelihood of actual litigation is also really thwarted by the fact that litigation is very, very expensive. Lawyers are very, very expensive. The burdens of, you have to make the arguments, you have to create and generate or identify the experts and the science you have to make the claim and prove that in court, which is very, very costly. And a lot of lawyers work for the industry and the industry has way more money. And 
So in tobacco litigation, it became called the scorched earth strategy where tobacco companies just outspent plaintiffs. They just, just kept spending money. And that ended up backfiring at the end of the day because tobacco uh, industry years ago, well, before the internet, you know, in court, you have a thing called discovery where you have to produce documents. And so when documents were requested from tobacco industry, tobacco industry said, oh, you want documents? Fine, here you go. And they gave way more than the plaintiffs could handle. But now those documents have been digitized and they're online, right? So that actually really hurt the tobacco industry. It kind of showed some of their activities in the background that were nefarious. But like, it's really expensive. So I would rather, like litigation is definitely a, a way forward. I would rather see, you know, that we have cooperative kind of buy-in, but also we can't just let industry be responsible for this on their own because it's like the, it's like the, the fox guarding the hen house, right? We need to have proper accountability. And I think, I really do think, and I, I, I kind of keep, you know, and this is why I'm so thrilled you guys invited me to come on. I think craft beer could change this. I don't know why craft brewers just aren't honest. Like, look, guys, you're spending more money. So we'll make even better beer. Just drink a little bit less. So rather than drinking one of these for $3, I'll drink, or, or two of these for $3 each, I'll drink one for six. And then maybe I'll drink less, but I get a great quality beer and we can partner. And I think, I think the craft beer industry might be open and amenable to, to that, provided that the, the brewers don't want to become, you know, instant billionaires selling off all their beer to and I'm has about Bush or something like that, right? But I think there is hope in, in that space. And also, like I saw in a report, like in, I don't live in London, but Anderson Craft Ales, like they're developing their own alcohol-free beers. And I'm like, this is fantastic. This is exactly what we need. We need craft breweries to start investing in making, like the cocktail industry is going to be years ahead of this. The cocktail, real good mixologists are learning how to make alcohol-free cocktails, really high quality cocktails and, and selling them to those that, may not want to drink they may already had one and don't want to have another and so the cocktails you have a little bit more opportunity to make it kind of i think match the flavors without the alcohol potentially but i think we can get there with beer jacob we're at our hour mark so obviously um this is probably a good ish place to end but i do want to end maybe with one final question i have a tradition of asking a lot of our guests to predict to make a, a little bit of a prediction towards the future. So maybe if you can look in your futuristic lens to the next five or perhaps 10 years, what do you see the outcome of this study from the Canadian Center on Sus Substance Use and Addiction? Where do you see this going? What ramifications yeah. in the macro sense do you see this having for the Canadian public? Obviously we hinted at potential lawsuits that could happen in the near future but what else obviously we also touched on potentially labeling that being changed in the alcoholic market perhaps seeing those that are equivalent to say what we see if we purchase a packet of cigarettes but what else do you see any other substantial effects to yeah. our culture to our society to our social fabric what will this mean in the next five or ten years I think there's a couple of things. One thing I think for sure that's going to shift and change in many people, I think in a five, 10 years time, people will understand more what a standard drink is. I think that's part of the conversation that's going to come out of this, that, you know, even if you don't want to drink less, you should know how much you're drinking, right? So I would encourage anyone listening to this, like, don't drink any less than you would normally, but pay attention to the quantity and the ABV, like write down, because not all like, you know, this is like as a fan of scotch every once in a while i forget oh yeah this bottle is 56 percent. that's why like that's no longer drinking the, like a, a shot's not a shot and a beer is not a beer right so pay attention to how much you're drinking and i think that's what's going one of the things that will come out of this that in order to be informed about the risk we need to know the quantity and that's something that really we don't have a good sense of um the other thing that i think i, I hope but i also think is going to change is that and i think cannabis is a part of this as well but I think that the next generation's relationship with these products is going to be different. I think young people drink less now than, I think when people drink, they drink a lot. I think that's what you mentioned earlier. There is, I think some, there are, there's problematic drinking behaviors, but I think that there is like, there are a lot of university students I meet that don't drink, right? They're, they can't afford to maybe, or they choose not to for studying purposes, but it's not, it's, I think that might be part of what this kind of evidence changes. It might change some of our discussions. And I think, you know, there was a point in time where people could not have imagined 
not smoking in a restaurant. And now it'd be unbelievable to walk into a restaurant where someone's smoking. And I grew up when I didn't have to wear a seatbelt. I'm old enough to have been in a car without seatbelts for many years of my childhood. And I can't imagine having my, my car running with kids in it without seatbelts. And I didn't wear a bike helmet all the time when I was a kid. You know, like, so we have changed our behaviors. And I think that we'll see that with, I think it will have an impact on future drinkers who now at minimum, there is this kind of more stark awareness that yeah, like it's not really safe for you. It's like smoking is not safe for you. It hasn't eliminated smoking, um, but people are at least more aware of it. But I really do think a lot of where the next five years will come will be standard drinkings. And if I was really optimistic, I think, I think labeling is coming. I think labeling requirements for alcohol, um, they're really hard to, to like, what, what is the real harm to industry to provide accurate information? And the, in the, and in the private law, it doesn't matter if you don't agree with the science that the courts have said, it doesn't matter if you agree with the science or not, if the science says there's a risk you have to warn. And so it's really hard to say we shouldn't provide that information to consumers. So I see that shifting in the next five to 10 years, but, but also I, I've been surprised with the last couple of years, but have, you know, one of the things that worries me is that right now, most people don't wear masks because they think eh, COVID's over, even though this invisible virus is actually very, very dangerous still and debilitating. And, and we're not talking about how to improve the air enough and other things. So we've kind of pushed public health to the side. So I'm also worried that in 10 years, nothing will have changed because people are just like, eh, whatever. And I think that has to do with a little bit of the defeatism and the existential threat of existence right now with climate change and other things like eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. It's hard to ignore when the world seems kind of bleak. But I think standard drinks is really the change that's going to come first and foremost. People should know that this is not a standard drink. This is this is a one point, probably 1.4 standard drink. Mm -hmm. And that would change my behavior. So if I drank two of these, now I've drank three drinks, not two, right? So that I think is probably on the forefront. Jacob Shelley, professor in the Faculty of Law and the School of Health Studies in the Faculty of Health Sciences at Western University. We appreciate your time and your expertise in making sense with these, this new report that has shaken our country up a little bit from the Canadian Center on Substance Use and Addiction. So we really yeah. appreciate your time and and this seems this really did fly by and we'd love to yeah, connect fun. again in the near future and yeah, potentially absolutely. rack your rack your brain a little bit further in terms of your expertise and, and any future developments we see in, in terms of alcohol in Canada. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'd love to talk again. Cheers. Thanks for having me on. Cheers. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all our interviews and beer related content. Remember, craft beer is here.